Um, hey, good morning, everybody. I figured I would compel you in the morning with a picture of our Scarlet Knight at Rutgers, <laughs> who actually is pretty fun at all the sporting events. There's a guy in like full suit of armor who walks around. It's really very cool, very imposing. I wish our <laughs> teams were quite as imposing, but very I think hot. our mascot does a good job. Very hot. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have no disclosures. I do think I probably talked about a couple things that are off label um, in all my lectures, but I'll point that out as I go along. Um, what we're going to do today is define that period of time called the perimenopause. Um, how do we recognize it? Is there a predictor? That's the most common question I get from my perimenopausal patients is, you know, when is my last period going to be? Kind of like our OB patients who ask us when they're going to deliver. Um, how to treat the perimenopause with some emphasis on abnormal bleeding and mood disorders. And I'm a little bit sad that I was moved to before the person talking about mood disorders in primary care because I'm spending some time on that and I was really hoping I was going to be clinically correct. But I am telling you what I do, be it clinically correct or not, it seems to work okay for my patients. Um, just a mention about contraception, although we'll talk a lot about contraception later in the day, and then a reminder that this is a great time to talk about future health matters. So definition of perimenopause is just what it sounds like. It's around menopause. It's not quite postmenopause. It's no longer premenopause. Most of the information that we have is from the SWAN study, study of women's health across the nation, which is um, a 15-year ongoing study of about 3,000 women aged 42 to 52, which had two stages. Initially, people were um, identified through telephone surveys and then via telephone surveys and medical records, they were followed yearly for the next 15 years, and that's where a lot of our information comes from. How do we recognize the perimenopause? Well, clinically, that's how we recognize the perimenopause. But what people talk about is irregular bleeding, hot flushes, a loss of anxiety and depression and mood disorders, weight gain, um, which I'll focus on tomorrow in the menopause lecture, sexual dysfunction, and generally just feeling unwell. They're not quite themselves anymore, and they want to be themselves again. They can have any or all of those symptoms. So what's happening on the inside? This is what happens when you're a premenopause, right? Is this a point or two? You have a nice cyclic um, uh, hormonal profile going on. Postmenopause, it's not cyclic anymore, but at least it's stable. And in the perimenopause, this is what it looks like, which I think is an incredibly telling slide. The one point that I have of this whole slide is FSH is this red dotted line. So look at these FSH levels. To me, that's the biggest argument for not checking FSH levels. They're not tremendously helpful. The 2011 stages of reproductive aging, again, this is straw. Um, what this points out, it starts off at menarche ends at the final menstrual period, and then the menopause transition or the perimenopause is right in here. And I'm, it also puts what are the things that support each level. What I want to point out here, and I'm going to make it bigger so we can actually see it, and that's just taking that menopause transition that was highlighted before, is the words that I find incredible. Variable, 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 Likely, most likely. So there's really not a great way to um, stage people according to those objective criteria that you have. And the best, the best measure is still going to be um, menstrual bleeding patterns. So the clinical utility, oh, I'm a little bit off on that side of the slide. Hopefully that won't make too big of a difference. But clinical utility of this chart, in my opinion, is really not much. So the next thing that people always ask, when is perimenopause going to be over? So we know we have lots of predictors of ovarian reserve. We can look at our day three FSH and estradiol. We can look at our anti-malarian hormone, our antral follicle count, our inhibin B. Those are all markers of ovarian function. They're not great markers of when ovarian ovaries are going to cease function. It can tell you that it's kind of lagging, it's working a little bit harder, um, that it's not quite as robust as it used to be, but there's no good predictor as to when it's going to end. And remember, these predictors of ovarian reserve are all still based on your response to
to in vitro fertilization, right? That's how they were all designed. That's how they were all studied. So what they're telling us more is what's your likelihood of responding to um, ovulation stimulation than it is really when your ovaries going to stop working. I think the best way to remember these, we all know that when FSH is high, it's bad. For those of us who get confused about the others, which is me, I get confused a lot. Everything else low is bad. So FSH high, everything else low, bad. Formulas that have come up for predicting the last menstrual period is an AMH combined with BMI and smoking status can predict menopause within three months, plus or minus three to four years. <laughs> I can do that to any 47-year-old who walks into my office. Um, what's interesting about that is that study is actually, it, it's better than it sounds, because that is looking at women in their 20s and 30s and you know, early 40s. So it actually is pretty good to predict from a 20-year-old when they're going to be in menopause within three to four years, 40, um, uh, 20 years later, 25 years later. But I don't know what the clinical utility of that is. One current and one prior FSH and estradiol level. I have given you the reference on the bottom of the slide. They say that in early perimenopause, this is a very helpful predictor. Now, that was me reading this article. I read that article 12 times, and I still can't figure out what they're trying to say. So theoretically, that's helpful. If anybody can figure it out, please read the article and email me, because I can't make heads or tails of it. The menstrual bleeding, um, no menstrual bleeding, for three months predicts menopause within the next four years, which is most act uh, not accurate in young women, OK? So first of all, I take offense as I get older, the definition of young changes. And two, no menstrual period for three months, again, within the next four years. So the bottom line is predicting menopause doesn't happen very well. Again, clinical utility, in my opinion, not much. Perimenopause, treating symptoms. Again, this is where I think the clinical importance is. So what's the most common presenting perimenopausal symptom is the abnormal bleeding. Even though it's the most common, you still have to exclude pathology. So it still has to be evaluated. Um, and we're going to go over that a little bit. Does everybody use the palm coin or coin or coin terminology of abnormal uterine bleeding? <coughs> that was introduced in 2011 by FIGO, and it has been endorsed by ACOC. POM stands for structural, and I call it coin E because for me, something that's a word makes a lot more sense than something that's not a word. So the POM coin E system stands for all the different reasons that you can have abnormal bleeding. So it makes differential diagnosis, if you just remember POM coin E, um, your differential diagnosis is spelled out for you, as long as you can remember what the letters stand for. Um, so we know all those things. The N stands for not otherwise classified. I guess because the I was changed to iatrogenic, they took away idiopathic. And the N, again, in my mind, stands for we have no idea. Other nomenclature that has been changed. Menorrhagia is now heavy menstrual bleeding, HMB. Metorrhagia is now intermenstrual bleeding, IMB. Dysfunctional uterine bleeding, DUB, no longer exists. It was not, it's not in any of those categories. So now that is AUB, which stands for abnormal uterine bleeding. But since DUB by definition was we didn't know what was happening, it's now AUBN. Okay, everybody got all these letters? So DUB is no longer part of the Palm Queen system, and we have to discontinue its use. And so I think we need a moment of silence for DUB because we all. We've all depended on it for so many years when we couldn't figure out what was going on. So now we're going to have some nomenclature practice, which I think is really fun. So menorrhagia due to fibroids, which is a sentence that all of us can understand, right? Well, now that's HMBL, or you can call it AUBL. Metorrhagia due to a submucous fibroid is IMBLSM. This is our terminology that's making it easier for us. <laughs> Metometrorrhagia, 
due to PCOS is abnormal uterine bleeding, AUBO, ovulatory. Menorrhagia due to von Willebrand's is HMBC for coagulopathy. And the headaches we're all getting from the Tom Cole system is <laughs> OMG why. <laughs> so evaluation of abnormal bleeding, I'm not going to spend time on this. We all know how to take a history. We all know how to do a physical exam, remembering that abnormal bleeding comes from other places than the uterus. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about imaging. Basically, the transvaginal imaging is the standard. Sonohistogram or saline infusion sonogram is best if you have an unclear ultrasound or suspect that something structural is there. MRI has very little role in evaluation of the endometrium. Um, laboratory evaluation, we always want to assess blood count. Don't remember thyroid and prolactin, which can still pop up even if somebody is perimenopausal. Um, if indicated, do coag studies. Um, every once in a while, you do pick up a coagulopathy of somebody at this point in their life. Um, you know, you can have somebody who's had heavy periods, which are normal for her, has not had surgeries, doesn't have kids. You can pick up coagulopathies every so often, um, and they also may be secondary. Um, again, the main take home, generally not helpful, FSH, estradiol, progesterone, those things really don't have a big role because they're so variable. And you can tell somebody they're in full-blown menopause one month, and three months later when they get a period, you can do the same blood work and tell them, oh, guess what, you're, you're out of menopause, congratulations. <laughs> so why do we have to do the sampling? And again, we're looking at what do we ultimately want to exclude? We ultimately want to exclude endometrial cancer, and you can see that endometrial cancer is very age-related. I left out, this is the part, these are, cases per year per 100, uh, cases per 100,000, but when you actually look at new cases, right in this area where you're kind of somewhere between here and there, that's where most people are gonna be diagnosed. And if you look at the chart, right here in this perimenopause, that 45 to 54, even 55-ish, right around there, that's where you're gonna have the largest number of women who are initially diagnosed with endometrial cancer. So you really need to pay attention to making sure that they don't have cancer and that it's not just their normal perimenopausal bleeding. Treatment of abnormal bleeding is going to depend on a couple things. Menopause symptoms, do we have to cover them as well? Yes. Are there medical conditions? We have to remember the um, contraindications. Do they need birth control? And you need birth control until a year after your last menstrual period. Um, and what do the patients prefer? If there's pathology such as a polyp or a fibroid, treat it as per the pathology. And I'm going to talk about polyps in a little bit because polyps make me crazy too. Um, the most common diagnosis in perimenopause is anovulation. So that's going to be AUBO. Um, and we can treat that medically with the same way we treat anovulation in anybody else. Okay, just because they're perimenopause doesn't particularly change that. We just have to look more carefully at coexisting pathologies that may exist or medical conditions. Um, surgical treatments, endometrial ablation, and I have after appropriate counseling, and we're going to talk about that a little bit coming up too. Um, and don't forget hysterectomy. Um, I, I don't know that at some point in time doing a hysterectomy has become a crime, um, but there are some women who really do benefit from hysterectomy. So we, we try to avoid hysterectomy, but when women come in and that's what they really want and it's not, it's not unreasonable, it's not unreasonable. So we're going to just do a couple cases. They're simple. I'm not talking down to you. I know you guys know how to do this. It's just a way of kind of doing a mindset, okay? So our first one is a 47-year-old, six-month history of progressively heavier periods, up to 10 days, no hot flushes. She's never missed a period, but she's concerned that she's perimenopausal. She needs birth control for a new relationship, and she wants an IUD. Her past medical history is a benign breast biopsy, promoted mammogram, and high blood pressure. Her BMI is 31. Her pelvic exam is normal. You do an endometrial biopsy, and your pathology comes back suggestive of an endometrial polyp. So she has HMBP. <coughs> Case 
42, 47 year old, comes to you concerned that her best friend was just diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Very common situation, right? And she's got vague abdominal pain ever since she heard about that. She would like an ultrasound. She has regular periods, except over the last year she's missed one or two cycles. She has a benign breast biopsy and high blood pressure, same, same medical history. Her BMI is 31, her pelvic exam is normal. You do a transvaginal ultrasound, because you're trying to look at her ovaries, and you see a one centimeter endometrial polyp. So let's talk about polyps, because everybody seems to have polyps. It feels that way, but it's really only 10 to 24% of asymptomatic women who are incidentally found undergoing endometrial biopsy or hysterectomy. I guess they're not asymptomatic if they're, their biopsies are hysterectomies. But the incidence is thought to be around 10 to 24% of women have polyps. Postmenopause, if you're on tamoxifen, it can go as high as 36%. Women undergoing evaluation for infertility, um, BMI less than 30 is 15%, but as soon as you see that BMI go over 30, you get up to 52% of women for infertility have polyps. Okay, so we all know polyps are probably related to excessive estrogen, so those are kind of our same risk factors. The risk of malignancy overall is about 5%, okay, so that's important to remember. In postmenopausal versus premenopausal, it's 5% in postmenopausal versus about 2 in premenopausal. And then in the postmenopausal population, if they have bleeding, um, it's 4% versus 2% if there's no bleeding in terms of malignancy. So obviously, the highest risk for cancer is postmenopausal women with bleeding. Okay, so does that help us? Is it, you know, can you tell somebody, well, there's only a 5% chance that it's cancer, so let's not do anything. Um, according to the experts, we kind of can. So, endometrial polyps, do we have to remove them if we find them incidentally? So, if they're symptomatic, then yes, they have to be removed if they're symptomatic and hopefully treat their symptoms. If they're asymptomatic, um, if they're premenopausal, remove them with risk factors for malignancy or the expert opinion from up to date, which is a collaboration, we all know what up to date is. If the polyp is more than 1.5 centimeters, if they're more than one, if it's prolapse to the cervix, obviously, or if it's infertility, um, I would probably also add in my mind if somebody's having miscarriages. Then, then that's when you should absolutely remove them. Postmenopause, you should remove them all. So whether we agree with that or not, that's the expert opinion. So, and again, the risk factors um, when it says don't remove them if some remove them if somebody has risk factors. The risk factors um, again, except for age and diabetes. And I guess the cancer syndromes, most of them are related to the population who's going to have excessive estrogen um, in their system. So in case one, she's got heavy periods lasting up to 10 days, no hot flashes. She needs birth control, wants an IUD, suggestive of an endometrial polyp. So what would you do with her? I think it's pretty easy. She's symptomatic. You need to remove it. While you're removing it, you can slide that low marina in there at the same time, and you've taken care of her. Case two, she's concerned. She has this vague abdominal pain. She has no real symptoms. She's asymptomatic. It's a one centimeter single polyp. According to expert opinion, you may or may not remove it. You don't have to remove it. I would at least do an endometrial biopsy if I wasn't going to remove it just to at least get a little bit of pathology on it. I have to say that I would tend towards removing it just because if it were my polyp, I would want it removed with a 5% risk of malignancy. And um, certainly in this 47-year-old concerned about ovarian cancer, no matter what you say, this polyp is coming out. So I would tend towards removal of, of most polyps. I'm just telling you what the expert opinion is. I, I still tend towards removal. It's just a reminder to whenever, just like mammograms, when we do all these extra tests, we find things and then we have to do things with the things that we find. 
So you remove the polyp, and the bleeding persists. And the person says, well, I've heard about endometrial ablations. Why don't I have an endometrial ablation? Okay. What are the pros of endometrial ablation? It's a pretty simple procedure, right? Um, it's outpatient, so people go home the same day. The satisfaction rate is from 70 to 90 percent, so that's a pretty good satisfaction rate. The lowest satisfaction rate is with the cryoablations. The highest satisfaction rate is with the microwave ablations. But I don't know if it's that different that it makes um, makes a big difference. I don't do them in my office, so I'm just dependent on what the hospital has. Um, and they change every so often. The cons is that it doesn't provide birth control. People need birth control. You do need to have the equipment and the expertise to, have to, to do the procedure. And even though the satisfaction rate is as high as 87%, the dissatisfaction rate can be as high as 33%. My biggest concern is the later evaluation for endometrial cancer. So what happens when you do an endometrial ablation, and I'm finding this now, is that all the people that I did endometrial ablations on when they were 45 and having lots of irregular bleeding, now that they're 55 and they're having postmenopausal bleeding, I'm really kind of in a quandary, right? It, it complicates the endometrial assessment. And the bigger quandary is that postmenopausal bleeding may not occur. So you may have enough scarring that if there is a cancer, the blood is blocked and you can't get to it. So what, what does the literature say about that? Well, transvaginal ultrasound, one, endometrial demarcation is difficult. So the less than five millimeter rule may not well, no longer be reliable. There is a study, and we're going to have to figure this out for my next lecture so I don't get cut off. Um, this study was, it was either 67 or 87 patients. It wasn't a lot of patients. Post-ablation, with or without bleeding, they were just brought back for a, um, a transvaginal ultrasound. The average ultrasound thickness of the endometrium was 7.7. .7. So again, every single one of them, or just about every one of them, was above that 5 millimeter limit. So we can't use that limit. With or without bleeding, if the endometrial thickness was between 5 and 10, they all had atrophy on pathology when they were able to get pathology. There was only one cancer in that group, and that was with somebody who had ultrasound visualization of endometrial thickening plus that echogenic fluid collection, which, you know, in your mind is like there's some blood building up back there to make sure that you got to that blood. There are other ways to evaluate the endometrium. Remember we talked about sonohistograms or endometrial biopsy. This is another small study with 57 patients, three to 10 years after ablation, um, trying to do saline, try to do um, his, uh, saline infusion sonograms. Only 15% of them could distend the cavity, so you couldn't really evaluate the cavity that way, and 18% failed because the catheter couldn't be inserted. So any of us who have tried to do a hysteroscopy or an endometrial biopsy post-ablation realize that if you can get through the cervix, um, that's, that's a big plus. In that same study, they tried to do endometrial biopsies under ultrasound guidance and realized that that doesn't adequately sample the entire cavity because they would get caught up into the pockets. Their conclusion was that Endometrial thermal ablation cannot be recommended for patients with high risk factors for endometrial cancer, which I think is a pretty reasonable um, evaluation. But let's look at a big study. This was retrospective of 200,000 women. Um, about 5,000 of them had endometrial ablation, and the rest had medical management. This was a, a major chart review where they just pulled up the um, the diagnosis of abnormal bleeding. Endometrial cancer in three of the ablation groups and 600 in the medical management group. The time to diagnosis diagnosis was not significantly um, significant between the two groups, which is ultimately the bottom line. If somebody's going to diagnose, be diagnosed with cancer, is having had an ablation, going to delay that diagnosis. No difference was observed in the endometrial cancer rates. 
Um, there was no delay in diagnosis when comparing endometrial ablation versus medical management. The conclusion was that further studies were needed to investigate the effect on the, the cancer stage. They didn't have information on staging a diagnosis. And that was one of the big drawbacks of the studies. And the other drawback of the study was that the, it was only an average of about 5.5 years after the ablation, and the average age of the woman was around 50. So if you looked at this again in five or 10 years, when you're gonna have a higher incidence, um, that may make a difference in, in terms of the diagnosis. So what does ACOG say? ACOG, again, the masters of vague recommendations, says that it seems like it's probably okay, um, and that delay in diagnosis is unlikely because of an absent, um, it, it, basically, ACOG is saying it's probably okay, we're probably not gonna delay diagnosis. Um, I think you need to use judgment in patient choice. You need to counsel patients adequately that if we fix their bleeding now and in 10 years they bleed again, they might wind up with a hysterectomy when they're 10 years older for lack of being able to evaluate them any other way. Um, and let patients, again, make an informed decision. Document your informed decision. There is a Cochrane meta-analysis, endometrial ablation versus the um, even adjustral containing IUDs that say that the quality of life and satisfaction measures were similar at one year. Um, endometrial ablation was more effective at one year, but by the time it got to years two and three, there was no difference between endometrial ablation and use of a Mirena IUD. So, just saying. Okay, case three. Am I doing okay on time? Case three is a 48 year old bleeding which has been ongoing for 22 days. Last period, six months ago. Prior to that, they were regular. She has moderate hot flashes, which are disruptive. She's well controlled, high blood pressure. She's had a tubal ligation, doesn't smoke. On her physical exam, her blood pressure is 140 over 86. Oh, we do a biopsy, ultrasound, endometrial thickness of seven, proliferative endometrium. So she has abnormal uterine bleeding, probably ovulatory. Case four, kind of the same history, except she's got regular, the, the same bleeding pattern, no hot flashes. She hasn't had a tubal um, ultrasound and results are the same. So she's also abnormal bleeding, ovulatory. So what's treating anovulatory bleeding? Again, it's all about protecting the endometrium, right? So we're just gonna go through quickly case three. She has hypertension 140 over 86, which I know to any internist or family practice or anything other than OBGYNs, 140 over 86 is not that bad. 140 to 86 to us is go to the hospital. Um, <laughs> does not need birth control. She has moderate symptoms and she has no preferences for treatment. So we don't really wanna observe her because we wanna protect the endometrium. I don't really want to give her birth control pills because she's got high blood pressure. Again, borderline to start birth control pills. Surgery is probably overkill. So that leaves us sick with progesterone, sick with hormone therapy, levonorgestrel IUD. The only one that would fix her in terms of her symptoms and her bleeding, sick with hormone therapy. We all know that that's a little bit rough when people are having still the ovaries kick in, you have higher risk of breakthrough bleeding. You could do cyclic progesterone plus an SSRI um, so that you can treat her menopause symptoms, or you can do a levonorgestrel IUD plus an SSRI, or you can add back estrogen. Okay, so it's not always one size fits all. Same patient, other, same history really, other patient, Again, we don't want to observe her. We don't want to give her pills because of her blood pressure. Cyclic hormone therapy is not going to give her um, birth control, right? She's somebody who needs birth control. She's in a new relationship with no tubal. Surgical is overkill. So we can give her cyclic progesterone plus barrier, or we can talk to her about permanent sterilization if she's interested in that or again, the levonorgestrel IUD because she doesn't have symptoms. 
So I know those are not hard cases, but those are just kind of the way to think about it. You have very similar patients, but it's like I said, one size does not fit all, and sometimes you need to mix or match together. I'm going to spend, do I have like 10 minutes? Spend the last 10 minutes or so on perimenopause mood disorders. And again, this is going to be really interesting for me seeing the lecture after this now. Perimenopause mood disorders, two and a half to three times more likely in the perimenopause even than in the postmenopause. Why? Nobody knows. Is it because of hormonal fluctuation? Um, there are some studies that say that if you have pre-existing mood disorders, it's worse. Some studies say it doesn't, so that's why there's a question mark there. It's theorized that the fluctuation in estrogen increases your sensitivity and vulnerability and your tendency towards depression and anxiety to, to normal life stressors. Anxiety, people talk about excessive worrying, worrying for no reasons, they can't turn their brain off. They could be aware that their thoughts are unrealistic. They may be focused on a single feel or it may be generalized. A panic attack is when you have acute severe anxiety that has the physical symptoms of palpitation, sweating, um, having difficulty breathing. And anxiety often coexists with depression. Treatment of perimenopausal mood disorders is kind of a triad of hormone therapy, psychotropic medication, and counseling. Hormone therapy for depression if you have a lot of menopausal symptoms, treat the menopausal symptoms first and see if that helps. What's interesting is studies have suggested that oral may be slightly better than transdermal estrogens in terms of mood disorders. Antidepressants for those without significant menopausal symptoms or contraindications to hormones, you may need to combine it. Counseling is always helpful. We should always try to get people into counseling. We all know the barriers to getting people into counseling. Anxiety, hormone therapy, the results vary. Again, if there's a lot of menopausal symptoms, get those controlled first. Medications, they talk about benzodiazepines and SSRIs. Really try to stick, stay away from the benzos. Cognitive behavioral therapy is associated with better long-term outcomes alone or even if it's added to other therapies. So again, this is, if, as a gynecologist, I think half of my practice is psychiatry. And so what you want to do is screen assess for severity. Somebody's suicidal or if they're really not functional, it's beyond what you can do in your office. Assess for menopausal symptoms, get those controlled. Become comfortable with one or two antidepressants. This way you can initiate treatment for somebody while they're waiting to see somebody else. There are cases all that they need. Learn a few cognitive behavioral therapy techniques that you can teach patients fairly quickly in your office. And know when and how to institute referrals. Breast cancer, I'm putting that ribbon up there because breast cancer is a big fear everybody has, right? For the next remainder part of the lecture, I don't want you to think about breast cancer at all, okay? So what are some of our cognitive behavior therapies we can teach people easily and in just a couple minutes? Breathing and progressive relaxation. There are apps for that, and I hope they'll be in the app section. But I always remember it as a flower and a birthday cake. That's how you teach people to breathe. Sniff the flower, blow out the candles, okay? Breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth. Try to do it long and slow, and while you're doing it, say something over and over to yourself that's gonna relax you. Distraction, it's a short-term help, not a great long-term option, and there are some studies that say it may make things worse. I have anxiety problems. I find it very helpful to me for short-term. Again, anybody stop thinking about breast cancer yet? Or you're all still thinking about breast cancer? Okay, so let's all stop thinking about breast cancer. How's it going? Okay, perimenopause rocks. How many words can you make out of that? I can find pause. I can find mean. How many other words? Yeah, what words? Men. Men. <laughs> no correlation, kids. <laughs> other words, come on. Okay, great. While you were doing that, how many of you were thinking about 
breast cancer. Okay? Great, quick distraction. Um, I do it on airplanes all the time. I can tell you how many words you can make out of fast and light jackets or life jackets or under your seat. I always tell people, good brain, bad brain. Bad brain gives you anxiety, good brain controls it. Bad brain is a lot stronger. Good brain needs to be engaged. Reading a book isn't good enough. You have to do something that's solving a problem because that will engage your brain. And even though we all think we can multitask, we can't near as well as we think we can. So that's a quick distraction technique I give people. Facing your worst fear, case scenario. Okay, what do people think? I have breast cancer, I'm gonna die. So what do they do? I'm not gonna think about breast cancer. How did that work? Okay, so that what I tell them is that, okay, turn around, look breast cancer in the face, and, and think about it. What's gonna happen? You're gonna get an opinion, you'll probably have surgery, you may need chemotherapy, you'll have many years of life, most people probably don't die of breast cancer, you can put all your affairs in order, which is a good idea for anybody to do anything, and then eventually we're all going to die. Let me go ahead and adjust this. What? Let me go ahead and fix your screen. Oh, okay. Well, that's okay. I'm almost done, so. Okay. okay. But anyway, so it takes you from breast cancer die to breast cancer, lots and lots and lots and lots of things, and then die. So again, you kind of engage the mind. The last thing is a worry log. Write down the worry, retrain the mind, okay? I'm afraid of, we're gonna stick with breast cancer. So this is your worry log. What's your event or thought that triggers your panic? What's your immediate thought, resultant feeling? What's alternative thoughts, and what's the resultant feeling? So your thought is I have breast cancer. Your immediate thought is I will die. Your immediate feeling is panic and anxiety. What are some alternate thoughts? Well, I don't have breast cancer. I'm worried about possibly getting breast cancer. I have regular mammograms. Even if I get breast cancer, I probably won't die from it. Okay, uh, and on and on like that, your resultant feeling, quite frankly, is still gonna be lousy, okay? I tell people, keep this kind of worry log by their bed at night, because sometimes if you're driving, you can't stop and write this down. And write things down. You're still gonna feel lousy for the first few times you get it. Eventually, you're going to retrain your brain so that when you think, I have breast cancer, you're going to immediately go to, I don't have breast cancer. I get regular mammograms. These are all the reasons I don't have breast cancer. And eventually, you're going to retrain your mind away from that immediate panic. Okay? Those four strategies are quick and easy. You can teach those to people. It's something to at least give them something to work on. Don't forget about contraception. The only age-related contraindication in regards to combined contraceptive is smoking. Um, we limit adjustral IUDs. I love those in perimenopause because then you can transition to menopause and just add some estrogen. Depo-Provera, I hate Depo-Provera. I would never take it. Um, I know people either love or hate it. The problem is you don't know if they love or hate it until after you give it and then you can't ungive it, but in the perimenopause when weight's a real issue, gotta give that some thought. Permanent sterilization is most common in this age group. And remember, this is a good time to talk to people about the other risk factors that are coming up. Cardiovascular, bone hurt, all their screenings and vaccinations. Oh, and now we're up to new questions. According to straw menopause staging system, elevated menopausal range FSH levels do not stabilize into, the correct answer is actually three to six years post-menopause. That's why those people who go into menopause show up six or eight or a year later with a period, that looks and feels like a period. They've recruited another follicle. Question two, according to the SWAN study, the best predictor of menopause stage is actually change in menstrual bleeding patterns. Question three, true or false, abnormal bleeding is so common you don't have to work it up. That's false. Question four, you can predict the timing of a woman's last menstrual period based on, I thought I sent in an E, which was none of the above. So it could be all of the above, none of the above, or any combination thereof of the above. So congratulations, we all got that one right. <laughs> Question five, true or false, the contraindications of combined contraceptives are age-based. 
so that's a difference in a four-year, 45-year-old, and that's false. That's it. My favorite dose frequency of cyclic progesterone. Okay, my favorite, well, this is a, it's kind of a loaded question. For perimenopause, when I'm worried about excessive um, estrogen, I, I will often do Provera. I'll do Provera 10 milligrams for seven days, and I'll tell people to take it if they have not had um, Provera being the drops of progesterone if they have not had a period for eight weeks. So I'll do Provera um, 10 for seven every eight weeks for no period. My favorite progesterone, if that's gonna be your question, is norethindrone, and if people have side effects with um, Modroxy progesterone, I'll go to norethindrone. The reason I don't always go to that as my first line is that norethindrone, and this is why it works so well for abnormal uterine bleeding <coughs> is that it converts a little bit to estrogen. So giving somebody five milligrams of norethindrone, um, it will convert enough that you're giving them about the equivalent of 0.625 of um, estrogen. So it works really well for controlling bleeding because you give them a little estrogen in addition to giving them the progesterone. 